All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Cato. I head up the marketing science business for Science Intelligence. And you can see that my designer got a little, she had a little too much fun with this. Um, but I'll be talking about whales in the wild. Um, we looked at our data set and we found some really interesting insights on the biggest game spenders. So I'm here to share some of that. Um, and so my goal today is make this clicker work um, to answer these three questions. So first, um, how important are these whales to a game's success? Are the successful games more reliant on whales or are they less reliant on whales? The second question I'll be uh, trying to answer is what are the different species of whales? Can we identify the different traits that, and can, can we um, cluster these users and find uh, the different species? And the third question is the billion dollar question, how do we spot the next whales? Um, and there's always kind of a conundrum there of you're trying to find your competitor's best customers who is by definition also the most loyal. Um, and so we'll be looking at different metrics um, and we'll see if we can um, help you identify the next whales. So, uh, give you a little more context on who we are. Um, Science Intelligence is a data science company, um, and we have about five million people uh, who, for whom we see their comprehensive online shopping behavior. Um, the way we do that is by uh, we're looking at their um, parsing data out of, out of uh, email receipts. Um, and one of the services that we provide is creating um, audiences uh, for for look like targeting, uh, especially for for UA. So here's the, the raw data set that we'll be working with in today's analysis. Um, these are the mobile game spenders. So uh, in the past 12 months, we have close to half a million users who spent money in games. Um, we've identified more than 4,000 titles. Um, and we found 9 million Google Play and iTunes receipts. Um, and the, the receipts are very important because we're able to identify um, from an anonymized basis who's buying what kind of product or what, who's buying what from which games, um, in what sequence, and what else do they buy. So, uh, so that gives us this view of the uh, a bird's eye view of the, the whole industry. Um, so each of these dots represents a game, and when we see that a game also tends to share a lot of a lot of customers with another game, we draw a line between them. So we see a, a whole network of different games, and we can kind of organize this a little bit. So we would uh, we would be able to cluster these games together. Um, so each of these games, each of these colors represents a game cluster. Um, so the games within the cluster tend to share a similar customer base. So that's kind of that's what we see from a very macro perspective. Um, and from a micro perspective, uh, we see at the individual level um, how much money they spend across all games. So what's their annual budget for games? And we'll call that per capita spend. Um, and this is the distribution of that. So. We were able to um, calculate um, that we found that 16% of the mobile game spenders, remember these are not just players, but the spenders. Uh, so 16% of the spenders are responsible for 80% of the revenue across all mobile games. And for the benefit of simplicity, let's just call these guys the whales. So the first question was, how important are the whales to game success? And uh, in order for us to look at this, uh, we are going to invent a new, a new metric. We'll call it the whaleness score. So we're looking at how reliant your game is on, on the whales. A game with a high wellness score might have 80% of their revenue coming from 7% of, of their people, um, whereas a game with low revenue or low wellness score uh, might have 80% of the revenue coming from 27% of the spenders. And we can calculate this metric across every single one of these games. Um, and we also see the, the revenue amount that's, that's flowing through, through our users. Um, so we're able to create um, a, basically a graph that compares wellness scores to revenue. So the further right you go, the more re reliant you are on the smaller number of people. So that's the high wellness score people. And then the y-axis is obviously revenue. So you can see um, that there's a, a strong, strong correlation here. Um, P games that tend to have higher wellness score tend to do better in revenue. And you can see on the top right, um, you see all these, the, the most prominent game titles that's in mobile game today. So Candy Crush, Mobile Strike, Game of War, Cl Clash of Clans, all these guys are very reliant on whales and they generate a lot of revenue. So what's really interesting here is also the exceptions to the rule. So the, the three outliers that we see here. Um, one of them is Super Mario um, and 
for them, it's a free-to-play app. You have to pay $10 uh, in order to unlock all the, the levels. And you can't pay more than $10 because uh, they don't accept any in-app purchases. Uh, so 80% of the revenue is coming from 80% of their users or the spenders. Um, Minecraft is you, you install, six, uh, there's a $6.99 fee for, to install the app, and then you can make in-app purchases. So they're slightly to the right of Super Mario. Um, but really what's interesting here is Pokemon Go, because um, it's been about a year since they launched, but they've really figured out a, a different approach of generating a lot of revenue. And what we, so we dug, in, dug into Pokemon Go uh, a little bit, and we saw that the way that they are generating all this revenue is not necessarily by uh, relying on a small number of people. Um, their, their whales actually tend to be smaller. Um, but what they do really well is they capture a lot of the, the, the high share of the wallet. Um, so if, if these users are spending $100, you know, $9, $9 may be going to Pokemon. So they really, they've been able to capture um, a lot of these, the, the share of these smaller wallets. So to answer the first question, um, yes, it is important. Um, the wellness score is very important. There's a strong correlation between um, how reliant you are on the whales versus revenue. Um, but there are also very some, uh, some notable games who's finding new ways to generate revenue. So that's the first part. And then there's the species of whales. Um, so each one of these actually was inspired by a species that we found. So, We'll find them, but um, so in order to do this, we're taking the 16% of the users that we found that's generating 80% of the revenue, um, and then we're going to look at what games they spend money in, and we'll cluster those users together. And so that way, we're able to identify the different species of whales based on what games they purchase. So we found 59 uh, very distinct species of whales. Um, and just to organize this a little bit, we can cluster them by demographic groups as well. So 59 species of whales across four families of whales. And we can look at what a whale species looks like. So here in the blue family of whales um, is a group of whales, a group of people um, who play Madden, NBA Live, NBA 2K16. So these are the sports whales. Um, and you can see the demographic of it. It's very intuitive. They tend to be male, 45 to 55, college graduate, higher income. And so for each of one of these 59 dots, we see this kind of information. And um, we also see the relationship between the whale species. Um, so the, the species that most um, resemble the, the sports whales are the Boom Beach whale, the Morville whales, as well as the Roblox whales, and so on. And if we take a step further, a uh, step back, um, the blue family of whale, um, we found that they tend to be the male 35 and older and higher income um, type people. So we'll continue this tour and we'll look at the other families of whales. We'll shift over here to the right. And so these are the younger male whales. Um, and they also tend to be lower income. And you can see there's a strong presence of the strategy games. So there's a Clash of Clans Whales, who is very dedicated to that one game. Um, there's the Game of War, and you also see Pokemon Go um, appear in a couple of these uh, whale species. What's interesting here is, for Clash of Clans, um, the, the big circle in the middle, that's your obvious whales. Um, those are people who's only spending money in your game. But if you look up top, there's also the Clash Royale, Clash of Clans, Pokemon Go whales. And for these guys, their money is being spread amongst different games. So from a Clash of Clans perspective, you may or may not be recognizing them as whales. Um, so the lesson here is there may actually be people who have a hidden, who are hidden whales, who people who have a lot of money to spend on games, but whose money is kind of spread across different games and you may not be capturing everything. So th I guess that's the Clash of Clans whales. Um, and then we have the more female-oriented whales. Um, so this group of whales are the female 55 and over. Um, and you can see Candy Crush is, this has a, a strong presence here. Um, and, but we also see a lot of casino game players here as well. So this is a very distinct group, group of whales that's very different from the, the other whales that we've seen so far. And that's our casino whale. 
And then lastly, the last family of whales is the, the younger female whales. So they tend to be under 35 and can see that they play a lot of casual games, a lot of the farm hero related games, um, as well as the cooking games and the Kim Kardashian ones. So that's our casual whale. And if we zoom back out again, um, we can see how they relate to each other. So the uh, family one, two, and four actually have some connection between each other, but the, the family three, the, the casino and the Candy Crush whales also tend to kind of live in an island there. And for each and every one of these whale species, we know their demographic attributes. Um, and so we can look at their gender breakdown versus age, and we can organize this uh, slightly differently. And so it looks like this. So the further right you go, the, the, the more female skewed that whale species is. So Candy Crush is an example of a whale species that's very, very female. Um, and if you go further to the left, it's more male. So Clash of Clans is a very male-heavy uh, species of whale. And you can see that the, the whales are very diverse. There's a lot of gender diversity, as well as there's a lot of age diversity. Um, but if we look at it in terms of quadrants, we can also see that some species, some, some of these quadrants are very densely populated. Um, so the bottom left and the top right, there's a lot of different whale species there. But there's not a whole lot of whale species who are older and male, and there's not a whole lot who are younger and female. Um, and this may or may not be true, but we may be, uh, it, it may be because we're still a fairly young um, industry and we're still discovering new species of whales, um, much the way that, that Pokemon Go has done. Um, so there may be actually uh, undiscovered whale species that uh, we haven't seen yet. So uh, what are the different species of whales? Well, we talked about the four families of whale species um, and the 59 distinct species. And then we'll talk about how do we spot the next whales. Um, to do this, I'm gonna use a whale analogy, because why not? Um, so this is the uh, natural habitat of the beluga whale. It's the, the white cute whale that you've seen in the like, animation and stuff. Um, they only live in the Arctic Ocean, so they live right around the North Pole. Um, so if you're trying to you know, lure them down to the Hawaiian Ocean, um, they won't move uh, because some whales are just too loyal, they're so committed to one thing that, you know, from a, from a game standpoint, like, they won't be switching games. And this map actually shows the, the blue whale, um, where the, the, the natural habitat of the blue whale, and they're all over the place. You can, um, they, they're travelers and they go across the ocean. Um, and so if you're trying to move a whale to come to Hawaii, these are the whales that you're looking for. So some whales can be convinced to swim in new waters, the only problem is they may just be passing it through. Um, and from a mobile game standpoint, you want them to stick around and you want them to generate enough revenue for you to justify the cost of acquisition. So the people that we are actually looking for are not the super loyal customers, um, especially for, for your competitive games. You're looking for people who are low to mid uh, loyalty, um, who are showing um, behavior patterns that, um, that says they're sticky. And both of these um, attributes we can measure. So with loyalty, we can, we can look at the share of wallet. Um, with stickiness, we can see how frequently these people change, switch games. Do they switch games more often than expected? Or do they you know, keep playing one game and then switch, keep playing that other game? So those are the two metrics that we looked at. And so we, we actually did the calculation for one, one game. Um, we looked at Candy Crush. And so each one of these dots now represents a user. The red dot is a high spender, and the blue dot is a low spender. Um, so the x-axis is stickiness, so the further right you go, the less frequently they switch games. Um, and loyalty um, reps is the share of wallet measure. So um, the higher up you go, the, the bigger the proportion of their spend that goes to Candy Crush. And you can see that in order for a, for a user to be um, generating a lot of revenue for you, they either have to be loyal or sticky, or ideally both. Um, the bottom left quadrant doesn't, there's a, it's full of blue, blue dots, um, and it costs money to serve these users, so they're not the most attractive people uh, to have in your user base. Um, and if you 
are, you know, if you pretend that you're the UA manager for a direct competitor for Candy Crush, you want to target ads to these people on the bottom right. So these are the people who are not loyal, who spend money across different games, but when they sp start spending money, they tend to stick around. Um, and so this is the acquisition sweet spot. Um, the only problem with this is uh, it's hard to really know who you're competing against. Like who are, like which games do you actually share customers with? Um, who, are, who should you be going after? Um, you can look at it from like a gameplay or a genre standpoint, from a qualitative standpoint, but that doesn't always give you an answer. There may always be some quantitative um, like surprises that you find by looking at these cross-game data. So understanding your, who your neighbors are is also very important. Um, and for that, you, you, you require um, a cross-game um, behavioral pattern. Um, and you, you need to be able to see that pattern to, to take action. So spotting the next whales, we talked about loyalty versus stickiness. You want to find people who are not super loyal, but sticky. Um, and in order to do that, and in order to be effective in your UA, um, you, want to, you need to be able to look at the cross-game behavior of these users. So we have a booth out there in the four corners today. Um, we're launching a product called Size Intelligence Amplify for user acquisition. Um, and here we are able to leverage all the, the cross-game um, purchase data that we see. Um, so yeah, come stop by the, the booth and we're happy to give you a demo. And that's our sports whale again. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I, I love it when you see data that proves mm -hmm. that, you know, what, what kind of behavior you should be looking for, and then you can act on, you can action, mm -hmm. it, you know, specifically. I particularly like that, that last chart where you're showing the stickiness versus loyalty. And how, I mean, obviously people need to sort of access the data, that's mm -hmm. where you guys come in, but how many people do you think are actually actively looking at their competitor analysis in that way right now? Um, so what we found so far is um, because mobile games as an industry is still young and we're still growing so much that our eyes have always been focused on our own KPIs, our leveraging our own first party data. Um, and so to answer your question, like, the, the competition doesn't matter as much today. Oh, it hasn't much, it hasn't matched, uh, it hasn't mattered much um, because there's so much you can do with your own data and there's so much data that you can dig in with, with and just with using your first party data um, but I, I think things will start changing especially as we um, become a bigger industry um, and you know you start spending so much money on the first party data that the you, you start seeing diminishing returns so um, I think there is going to be a shift in um, the, the mindset there. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think we have time for one question if anyone wants to ask it. Any, any willing volunteers out there? In which case? Oh, we've got one there. Here at the back. So, where do you get the competitive data? What's the next? So, the question mm -hmm. for the microphone, because um, uh, we, we're recording, is uh, where do you find that data? Yeah, so the, the data set that we are looking at is all coming from email receipts. Um, and the way we get our data is uh, we have a couple of proprietary apps that we own where the user would sign up and uh, we provide them functionality. Um, and that's, it's basically the email utility tools that we provide. Um, and in return, we are able to find um, those purchase data from the receipts. We anonymize them um, and we monetize them through research reports as well as audience creation. Cool. Well, Ron, thank you very much for All that. Right. that was great. Thank you very much. Cool.